Well, um, the issue of the monthly, which is about to come out, which I had the good fortune to be allowed to edit, uh, does deal in a lot of its material with things that both Paul and I feel very strongly about. Um, when I was asked to edit it by Murray Schwartz, um, I didn't really have to think too long and hard to think about what the most important things are to me as an artist working in Australia. And the thing that always comes back to my mind is the fact that the First Nations of this country um, are the inheritors of and, and continue to practice the oldest living artistic traditions possibly in the world. We really can't say to any degree of accuracy just how old they are. But the idea of uh, a work of art being, in a way, a model of the universe is something which I have learned from my own work with Indigenous Australians. In the sense that if there is a song, then there is a place. If there is a song, there is a dance. If there is a song, there is a story. If there is a song, there is a journey. And that to try and separate out the elements of those things, as we might in our society, is virtually irrelevant when you're talking about the function of those things. They're as much about place and identity as they are about time and space. And in a way, they dissolve all of those things. And Paul has written a piece in the monthly uh, about his own engagement with a kind of a secret history, if you like, of popular music in Australia, which is um, his engagement with the music of our Indigenous people. But specifically, in this article, it's the songwriting traditions, the contemporary singer-songwriter tradition. And Paul, I just would like to really start by asking you how it is, uh, for you as a singer-songwriter, how do you relate to the legacy and the continuing legacy um, of our indigenous singer-songwriters? Um, for me, it's, it's started with friendships um, and started from travelling. Um, around about the mid-80s, uh, when I got the band going, we, would always, we were always pretty keen to get to play other places besides cities or the regular routes. So um, we were open to um, offers to, to play various places. Um, we did a, a tour around um, um, northern, you know, far north, northern territory communities in the late, late 80s. So Which was, band was this? Was, uh, with the Coloured Girls. The Coloured Girls, yeah. right. And uh, that was um, sponsored by an art, NT Arts Council at the time. So um, we could, you know, we couldn't have really afforded to go there on our own because it was sort of pretty expensive travelling around. We were, you know, some places we were flying and little planes and so on. Um, but uh, I guess um, just getting invited to places and then, then meeting people and, and starting to hear the music. Um, also, um, I remember meeting um, members of No Fixed Address when they played in Melbourne and just going to see them play and then, you know, going up and chatting afterwards and then we all went back to my place around the corner and, you know, put out the guitars and... In fact, Bart Willoughby from No Fixed Address was, uh, was uh, sort of showing me how to play reggae chords properly because I, was, I wasn't sort of doing it the right way, so I needed to choke it more. So, so things like that. I, I met the members of uh, Yothi Indy when I was touring in America. We were in Chicago the same time as um, uh, they were. They were touring with Midnight Oil and we had a night off and we went down to see Midnight Oil and... It was Yothi Indy were playing, so mm. uh, they were amazing. Yeah, as you said, it was not just a band up there playing songs. There was, there was, they were in traditional. Some of them were in sort of, you know, just rock clothes, and some of them were in full, you know, full paint. Uh, there was dancing um, uh, and the songs and the storytelling and the whole, the whole, the whole experience. So. Um, 
Uh, yeah, all, all my relationships have sort of started through encounters, sometimes chance, sometimes just being invited, meeting Kev, Kev Carmody. Um, again, sort of, this is all a very similar period from the mid to late 80s. And, um, uh, playing on the same bill as, as people like Kev Carmody and, 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 and bands like Coloured Stone, Warumpi Band. Um, at the time when the when the um, land, right, land rights was was um, gaining some momentum and the homelands movement was, was was starting to build and people were were getting country back and going going back onto onto their lands and uh, there was also a sort of um, a big wave of solidarity in, in the cities with the you know, rock against racism concerts and uh, the Building Bridges concerts that um, again sort of started in Sydney with uh, and blossomed into sort of a record as well with um, promoting um, collaborations between white and black artists and so on. So it was just all, all part of that. The music was harder to get hold of in those days, wasn't it? I mean, it wasn't uh, that easy to find. If you were a person uh, growing up in the cities of Australia, it would be hard to find a Warumpi Band recording or some of those you know, early bands. How did they actually distribute the music amongst their own communities? Uh, I think Warumpi Band, Warumpi Band were, you know, they were a, uh, a really influential band because they, they had their first... Uh, I think their first single was um, Jalanguru Pakanu, which is literature for Out of Jail, and it was it was this is 1983, and it was um, it was it's supposedly it's a, you know the first kind of rock pop song in an in an Aboriginal language, um, and you know that was a big song, and so I, I don't know, run people probably just distributed through a, probably a fairly mainstream record company. I'm not sure of that. Um, Coloured Stone, uh, uh, I think even just before Warumpi, um, No Fixed Address came out with We Have Survived, and that, and that was yeah, uh, that was also a very big song. Um, and Coloured Stone, all these bands were hitting pretty much the same time, 82, 83, 84. Coloured Stone had Dancing in the Moonlight and Black Boy. Yep. Black Boy was a huge hit in Fiji. I think it sold 400,000 copies of Black Boy in Fiji. But... Um, when I first was going into the play, starting to play in some Aboriginal communities, and it started off mainly in the territory in the, in the late 80s, these bands were they, these bands were like you know they were like big big stars, yeah. and everywhere you'd go, you would hear these songs just coming out of little beatboxes, um, ghetto blasters, um, and it was around that time. Um, that Karma radio station had, had started up. They'd started up in the early 80s too, I think, Central Australian Aboriginal Media Association. And that was a radio station at first. That's how I, I first knew it. It's a radio station. We came to play in Alice Springs and Darwin and some places more remote. And um, part of the, you know, promo or the touring, you go into the radio, come a radio station and, and plug the show and sing a song and so on. And um, we sort of, every time we went, we, we always play Alice Springs and, and Darwin pretty regularly, um, not always getting out, getting out to communities, but uh, we'd always go into Karma every time we went to Alice Springs. And um, Karma, you know, as, as they went on, they expanded to become, well, they became a TV station, Imparja TV, and then they, be, they became a record company where they started recording the local bands um, and bands from all over the Territory. And uh, I think I noticed that there was this just created a great sort of energy or like a feedback loop. Whenever you get a a, a record company that's that's um, operating not not in the mainstream areas, you see it you see it in Seattle with um, Sub Pop. You know, around that record label, all these bands emerged as you know Nirvana and Pearl Jam and Mud Honey and so on. I remember Greasy Pop in Adelaide was, was the same thing was happening. Uh, uh, then when bands get... I mean, the, the, these bands are always there. They're playing and they're making music, but they get to record and then they hear back what you're recording and it sort of um, you get, makes you get better much quicker at what you're doing. Mm. Mm. 
it's um, an interesting thing. You mentioned at, right at the beginning of the, of the piece in the monthly uh, a song which you must have heard in the early 80s, I think, which deals with the stolen generation. Um, and it's a song I think you know, in fact. Mm. Tell us about that song. Um, it's a song called uh, Brown Skin Baby, written by Bob Randall, and he wrote it in 1963. And uh, it's, um, it tells the same story that uh, Archie Roach's song Took the Children Away does, about um, uh, being taken away from your parents as a child. And uh, it was Bob Randall's um, story. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I just I can still vividly remember the first time I heard it. It was just sort of sent that made the hairs rise up in the back of my neck. Um, and uh, it's, again, it's one of those for me. It's like one of those um, sort of classic classic song. I, I started, you know, when I started um, tra- traveling around and in the territory and, and getting cassettes off off. Uh, Karma radio station and of the various bands and uh, you know it all, and various songs were sort of hits you know but maybe just hits in the in the territory or they were big songs everywhere we, we went and uh, years later I would start to sort of compile my own little hit parade which is sort of the genesis of, of the piece I wrote. Bob Randall's song is sort of is like a sort of a generation before and it was it's a it's a country and western song. It was the other thing that that struck me first, um, being around Aboriginal people or, or going into communities, was how popular country and western music was. Mm. Slim Dusty, you know, it's huge. And uh, it's always very handy if you're ever playing uh, out, out that way is to um, have a couple of Slim Dusty songs in the <laughs> repertoire. I sort of find it quite useful. And what's that about, do you think? I mean, what, what is the relationship to the whole country and western thing? Um... No, I don't know. I think it, you know, country and western uh, uh, is a is a very easy vehicle for putting stories onto. Mm. It's also um, it, it, you can you know it can be played on one instrument or you can pick up a guitar and play it. So it's it's fairly it's uh, the tools for it are quite quite easy to reach, um, and uh, it's it's just got. Um, I oh, know. I think you know. It's, it's sort of. There's a. It was a lot of cat, cattle stations and stockmen, and it's it's sort of cow. You know, cowboys. I know there's connections all over the place. Yeah. Country and Western has a connection to country and wide open spaces, and um, uh, and can express lament and longing very well. Mm. Well, that's right. I mean, a lot of them are songs about, you know, broken hearts and loneliness, in fact, mm. and that, that sense of being an individual in a very, very big place. Mm. Um, are you able to perform that song? You know that song, don't you? The Bob yeah, Rick. I can play it. Um, yeah, uh, it's funny, this song, because I, um, you know, when I always knew the song and I uh, knew it for years and years and years and... Um, had heard it played around campfires and so on, and then, then when I start, was started to write this piece, uh, I never sort of learnt it to play or anything. But I went back to the lyrics, and the first thing that struck me was that um, the it, it's not um, Bob Randall, the writer of the song. He's he's not. It's his story. I didn't even know that at the time. It's actually his story. He was taken away from his mother, from his parents as a child. And um, by the time he got back, look, you know, he grew up, went, went to a, a, a mission home, he says in the song, and by the time he went back to look for her, she died. So he never, they, he never got to see her after that. He was taken away. Um, but I noticed when I, when, when I sort of studied the lyrics is that he, he, the song is told by a preacher. Mm. The song is told by a white fella. And then... Uh, I just thought, oh, that's... At first I thought, oh, that's odd. I understand he would put the song in the voice of his mother, say, because it was her, st- her story as much as his. But he framed it with, uh, with a preacher telling the story. And I thought that was pretty interesting. 
uh, I think. Um, well, he was able to sort of frame it. Well, also, you know, it was a very emotional song, so it gives, it, gives him a, it's a very smart artistic decision, I think, that he did that. Gives you a slight, just a slight stepping back mm. to frame it that mm. way. And they also wonder, it was 1963 when he wrote it, and um, he was a grown man when he wrote it. I mean, he was in, living in a country where he didn't, couldn't vote. So that would make you feel maybe a little bit sure, less sure about your own voice. So, I mean, I don't know, that's, I'm just speculating, but... Um, I'll see if I can remember all the words. <coughs> <coughs> Yeah, yeah, my brown skin baby, they take him away as a young preacher. I used to ride on a pied pony round the countryside in a native camp. I'll never forget the young black mother, her cheeks all wet. Yeah, yeah, my brown skin baby, they take him. Between her sobs, I heard her say, Police been taking my baby away. To what man boss that baby I had? Why they let him take my baby away? Yeah, yeah. To a children's home, my baby came. They gave him new clothes and a new name. Night and day, he would say, Oh, mommy, mommy, why they take me away? Yeah. The child grew up and he had to go from that mission home that he loved so. To find his mother, he looked in vain. On this earth, they never met again. Yeah, yeah. So, I guess you know, he wrote it in 1961. Three, um, 1963. 1963. So, what, what interests me is, well, what sort of gigs was Bob Randall doing? I mean, what would be a typical, you know, sort of journey of Bob Randall in terms of... Uh, you know, um, there would have been, you know, a, a, there was a, a great tradition of, um, you know, country singers and, you know, pretty well known working country sing Aboriginal country singers that worked all around the country. Um, you know, guys like Roger Knox and um, Bobby, Bobby McLeod. Um, uh, um, Jimmy Little, yeah. of course. Um, there's a great, great book and DVD and double CD set called um, Buried Country, the, the story of Aboriginal country, country music written by Clinton Walker. Mm. Um, and that came out, I think, uh, maybe 10 or 12 years ago. Um, 
And yeah, I think it's a great book. Clinton did, did some fantastic research, and um, he he writes about all these people and their stories and all that music. Um, and uh, I, th I think um, now I know, I know you know you know they say Jimmy Little was rediscovered in you know in nineteen when was it nineteen yeah, yeah. when um, he made his, the record The Messenger with um, um, Brendan Gallagher from Karma County you know and put together a set of contemporary songs and that, that you know sort of put um, Jimmy back in the limelight again, but um, he was, I mean, he, he never stopped working, you know, he was, and I remember our friend uh, James Black saying, he'd, you know, gone to see him play, you know, saying, just gone to see Jimmy Little at the country fair and how great he was. And mm. So uh, a lot of these, gu these guys and men and women, you know, they didn't stop working. There was always, you know, always places to play, but... Not but necessarily that they were playing in the capital cities. <laughs> well, but would a song like that have formed part of his set, do you think? I, I, I would think so. I think he, they wouldn't let him get off stage until he played that one. Right. Probably. Yeah. I'm guessing. Well, that's, uh, I guess what I'm driving at is this has been a way of you know, allowing or enabling uh, Aboriginal people to tell their stories. It's a, it's a kind of method of conveying information, which is... Uh, it is a, essentially under the radar, isn't it? It's a, a way of maintaining a kind of a, a position at a time where there was no voice and that that music became increasingly more powerful as a way of conveying that message over the years. Yeah, I mean, the music never stopped. And then it's a, but it's sort of the way of, it's sort of the way of showbiz. Sometimes, sometimes your light gets, gets, gets shone on what you're doing. You know, you're in the beam for a little while, then it moves on. I mean, at the time I'm, I'm talking about with, uh, with the resurgence of all the, you know, the community bands and bands in the territory and bands that I became aware, aware of, again, through all these karma recordings. But there was a, a general resurgence, I think, of, uh, of um, indigenous music and uh, interest in, in, uh, in not just music but in culture and art. And um, so I think a, a lot of those country 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 performers were, were, you know, again, got more work around that time or were, um, got a chance to make, make records. Guys like um, Vic Sims, who uh, made a, a great record in, in um, Long Bay Jail, uh, all his songs with, a, with a, you know, songs like um, Stranger in My Country and um, he, he recorded with a, a horn section and, you know, got a proper record company behind him and so on. Um, and the whole thing was done in Long Bay? Yeah, he was in prison at the time. So, wow. Uh, they, uh, I mean, I think there was some politics going on that, that, that they were, it was a bit of a promo exercise for how the jails was going, you know, yeah, look. We're great here. Yeah, yeah. it's last great here. Yeah. Have to listen yeah. To. Um, but, yeah, he wrote some great songs, uh, Vic Sims, and he, I oh, know he's still, he's still, yeah. Uh, out there working. Mm. Um, as you know, I, I do quite a bit of work with more traditional singers, and um, I've become fascinated by this notion um, that a song, as I said uh, earlier, is, is more than just one thing. It's a kind of a whole... I mean, it's a model of a belief system. And... Um, uh, just to fill in a bit of detail here, uh, I've got a project going on with the Australian Art Orchestra which is called Crossing Roper Bar and um, it's working with traditional uh, musicians who are ceremonial musicians and they live in a place called Nooker in South East Arnhem Land and these guys travel around various communities within quite a large area uh, and the reason for that partially is because the people from the various outer lying parts who would normally perform their ceremonial functions as they get old and pass away, a lot of the knowledge which is associated uh, with those people passes with them. And so the uh, responsibility falls more and more on whoever is around uh, to fulfil these functions. So, you know, you go out and do um, you know, funerals and, and circumcisions and, and these various very important uh, things that take place. But... Um, the fascinating thing about these songs is that 
uh, whenever they're sung, and I've travelled from community to community with these guys, whenever they are singing the songs, they are essentially bringing that place with them. They are, in the moment of singing the song, putting that place in another place. Mm. And this, uh, this notion of you know, music or, or performance as being a way of completely transcending uh, linear time, which is something which is a notion that, you know, in quantum physics, for example, uh, we, we can talk about from a Western scientific point of view, but it's a notion which I think Aboriginal people have held uh, for, for many thousands of years, the idea that, you know, time and space are relative things and that ideas about them can be transmitted uh, through the act of creation, the act of making things. You're stepping out of the here and now into a kind of, um, well, a parallel reality, if you like. It's an extraordinary kind mm. of, um, of knowledge. And the fact that you know, there is a connection between that very, very ancient method of storytelling and the continuation of that via the modern capsule song I mean, I look at Archie Roach's work, for example, and I think you know, he tells so much with such kind of distilled means. It's a very, very powerful way to compress a lot into a very small yeah, form. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, the other thing I noticed when I was starting to hear bands um, uh, recording on cassette um, in the various languages, whether it's Walpuri or Lurature or Pitanjara, um, and uh, a, a lot of the songs were instructional songs, you know. So there's all, all kinds of songs, you know, with it. Um, and a lot of the, the bands I'm talking about um, were sort of had a... Well, they followed on from this. They sort of picked up from this country and western tradition. So they were, there was a lot of country rock. I remember, you know, late 80s and a lot of, a lot of, the, it'd be, a lot of the bands were just, you know, a couple of guitars, bass and drums and... Often with with chorus on the guitars and mm. uh, a real sort of country rock sound, but yeah, singing in their own language, which sort of so the phrasing would be sort of different to normal song structure. So they and have um, sort of unusual bar links and, and so on. There are lots of song about you know songs about the land and the country. Um, you know sometimes you know. Pr- proud, joyful songs about the country. Other other songs were laments about the loss of country, and and other songs. And there were love songs, of course, and and there were songs about you know, um, give up the grog, or you know, or you know, you know, you need to sort of wash your hands after you know when you, in. I mean, just basic sort of health sort of instructional songs, and um, uh, and that's. You know, to me, that's 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 sort of part of a very traditional use of song. Is there a tradition also of the sort of you know the missionary song, like uh, the influence of missionising in the singer-songwriters? Ah, oh, yeah, that's interesting. I should play Yellow because I find that a really interesting song. But um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of there's um, I mean there's Hermansburg Choir. Um, they uh, they they you know. Strong the, the Lutheran mission there, and um, there's yeah, there's a lot of um, um, uh, Christian, you know, Christian Christianity. Uh, oh, I mean, Christian music or gospel music or mm. you know, hymn, hymn, hymn music. So that's yeah, I seem to come across that a bit. Yellow being the Joey Guyer song. Yellow, that, and that's an, yeah, uh, Joe Guyer, who's from uh, Northern Queensland. Uh, Google Yimita. Yep. And um, he, again, this is a song, I think it was written in 1988, and he was living in Melbourne then, and recorded with a, a, a group of Melbourne musicians, James Black again, mm. on the piano, and mm. I think maybe Ross Hannifer was playing guitar, but he had a sort of stellar, stellar band. And we he actually performed it with him on the Vizard show, believe it or not. Did you? Yeah. 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 And uh, that's just sort of again, sort of become a, a classic. Yeah. Um, uh, and yellow, I mean, it's it's written in English except for the chorus, which is yellow, which is uh, Google Yimita for sing. Um, I'll, I'll sing you the song, but the, but the second verse 
to me, it sort of sounds quite Christian. Sounds quite Christian. I must say, Gugu Yimita is an interesting language. The, uh, the word kangaroo is a Gugu Yimita word. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah? it, it was Gugu Yimita because uh, Joseph Banks, when they were marooned in Cooktown, when he saw uh, the kangaroo, he asked, of course, what it was. And he was told it was a, a gungaroo, wrote that down, and hence that's why we call it a kangaroo, because, of course, that's a, a local word uh, from Cooktown. And... Here's a song in that language. Well, a song about that language. language. Yeah. Get a singing kangaroo in the song. <laughs> I've sung it a lot of times. This song at various concerts um, because it's um, it's built for harmonies, for singing along and singing harmonies. So um, it'd be great if you guys could, if you feel like it, want to <laughs> have a little sing. And uh, the chorus is just uh, the chorus is just. That's all it is. So someone can go. You just pick your harmony, or just pick the melody. Got it. Roll tape. for the I sing for the black and the people of this land. I sing for the red and the blood that was shed. Now I'm singing for the gold of a new year. Young and old You la lay, la lay, la lay, la lay, la lay You la lay, la lay, la lay, la lay, la lay I sing up to him of the Most High I sing so much praises makes me want to cry now I'm singing just for you so all can recognize you lale La lay, la lay, in the land. You la lay, la lay, la lay, you la lay, la lay. I sing for the black, I sing for the red, I sing for the black, I sing for the red and gold. singer but she was also an incredible songwriter mm. um, and one of the things that I loved about her songs was the fact that she would always completely forget about uh, what you know might work in terms of scansion in, in a conventional sense and fit these extraordinary kind of syllabic constructions into normal song mm. forms because she was telling the story and the story had to be told just so yeah 
you know, yeah. and the choice of the words and the order of the words was incredibly important. And I remember visiting her, actually, you know, she used to have bouts in hospital quite a bit, as you know, with respiratory mm. uh, issues. But she was a prolific writer and, um, and had the most beautiful handwriting. And she'd just write reams and reams and reams. These songs would go on. They were like, you know, the Iliad, some of those. Things. They, were just, they just were massive construction. Yeah. And then you'd have to try and kind of find the right form for them. Yeah, you, what was it, the River Song that you did, the show that you did with her? Yeah, we did Kura Tunga with her. And we also did a show called Ruby's Story, which yes. was, yeah. uh, you know, she told the story of her life and her great love, which, you know, the story about she and Ruby is one of the great love stories. Mm. And how uh, the two of them, you know, had basically been stripped of their identity um, and found each other in Victoria Square. And Archie wrote the most beautiful song. Uh, the first time I met Ruby, it was like a movie, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a, oh, just even thinking of that song gives me goosebumps. But um, you know, and how the the love they found for each other was the pathway back. Not only to the to finding their uh, regaining their identity, but literally regaining their land, mm. because of course they ended up you know buying that land in uh, near Renmark. And, yeah, yeah. You know, it was an incredible story yeah. about the redeeming power of love, but also uh, a story about you know self-respect told through music. Mm. Very powerful stuff. But one thing I, I learned from her uh, it was an amazing moment, and I'm sure you've had many moments like this, but. You know, I grew up in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne. I had nothing to do with Aboriginal people when I was growing up. I really never, didn't know any. And it was only much later in life that you know, I, I started to mix in circles where, as a musician, where I was uh, you know, starting to work with them and get, get to know them. When we started to do that project with Ruby, I spent you know, quite a bit of time with them in their country, mm. or her country, uh, she was part uh, Naranjuri woman and Pitatanjara as well. But she was born traditionally, she was born in, in a billabong. And, That's uh, right. And she yeah. wrote a beautiful song about being held up to the moon in her grandfather's arms, mm. wrapped in, you know, in ashes. Um, but we were sitting by the Murray River one night. Uh, it was at sunset. And... Um, we'd just been to visit one of her relatives to get permission for her to be able to tell her story. And, you know, it was a really beautiful moment. It was, you know, the birds were singing, the sun was setting. It was just that beautiful, that light just before sunset where everything is slightly more mysterious and you feel a sense of intimacy with a place. And she started crying, you know, and, um, you know, I didn't quite know how to handle it and, and Archie was with us and he was, you know, consoling her and she just turned and, and said, this is my land. And they took it. They took my land away. And when you have that sense of, of immediacy about a person and their place and the fact that that sense of it being their place but not being their place... It's very powerful. I think you know, a lot of Australians have never really understood that, that very, very basic, very simple thing, mm. that our knowledge, our idea about owning something and by dividing it up and parceling it out is about as far away from you know, the Aboriginal sense of what a land's relationship to a person is. Yeah, the land owns them, yeah. not the other way around. Yeah. So... Everywhere I turn, I see you. It's like I open the paper, there you are. There's a movie. You know, it's Paul Kelly, the movie, the book. You know, you're almost like the Lord of the Rings. It's like a, <laughs> you've become your own franchise. Um, what is next for you? What's coming up um, in your busy, busy life? Well, right at the moment, I, I just came today from rehearsals with uh, NM students, the Australian National Academy of Music, and I've uh, been working on a piece, a collaboration, uh, written with James Ledger, a modern class classical composer. James has actually dragged him along tonight, so he's here. Um, um, and that, uh, that's, that started about... Oh, nearly two years ago now when Anam approached me to, to do a song cycle. And what uh, form is it taking? Tell us about the, the actual work itself. What is it? 
Um, well, it's um, it's uh, it's uh, how do I, how do I describe it? Um, I, I'd um, when you know when I got asked to do this, um, I'd just sort of come off writing a book, and that was a lot of words, and I hadn't written my own songs for a long time, and I, I knew I wanted to write to try and write songs for you know a sort of normal record of mine. <laughs> and, um, and I sort of, I'd said yes to this when I Anna my face, but I said yes straight away because I just thought it was such a scary idea. Um, and, but then um, I sort of felt very rusty or lacking confidence about coming up with a, a set of words, especially a song cycle. So I just started looking at poems, some of my favourite poems. And the first one I looked at was um, Five Bells by Kenneth, Kenneth Slesser. Australian poet. Um, Great poem. Uh, yeah, and a quite, quite a long one, but a yeah. beautiful, beautiful poem. Mm. Beautiful imagery. Mm. Um, so I just sort of sat down, I opened the pages of the book and sat down in front of this poem and started trying to sing it. And I got about a third of the way through and then sort of, you know, sort of got bored with what I was doing. But I thought, well, that's a start. And I, I sent it off to James and he, he sort of said, well, it's got possibilities. And then he suggested um, uh, a section of Tennyson poem, In Memoriam, which is, uh, and this section starts off with the lines, uh, ring out wild bells to the wild sky. And um, like the Slesser poem, it's a, it's a poem to a dead friend, honouring a dead friend, ringing the bells for them. So we sort of, once we, we just had those two poems and, and that was sort of, okay, there's, that's our... There are twin pillars, I guess, and if we sort of write or pick things around that, um, we'll, have a, we'll have a song cycle. So we started picking out other poems, and then, th- and then I started writing a few things as well, as, as, yeah, as you do when you sort of get ideas <laughs> coming from other people. <laughs> um, so it, it's turned into a, um, 11, 11, 11 pieces, is it? 10 or 11? 11. 11. 11 plus 1, yeah. <laughs> and, um, That'd be 13. And it, start, it starts with Yeats, uh, it's Judith Wright, um, uh, Les Murray, Kenneth Lesser, uh, Tennyson, um, Emily Dickinson, uh, we have, we, um, Genevieve, John Laws? Genevieve Blaser, the, rec- the recorder player, was, you know, was, we've, she's been on board pretty early on. Right. So it's us uh, and Jim's playing electronics, um, as well as conducting, as well as having written this uh, amazing music, um, we've got um, the students at Anna, or you know, young young players, oh, really high cali- oh, caliber players, yeah. play with great verve. So, so when can we see this masterpiece? Uh, very soon, October October the twelfth and thirteenth at the Melbourne Recital Centre. Yeah. October twelfth and thirteenth, and October the tenth in Sydney. You're a very curious man, aren't you? I mean, the f- I don't mean that, I don't mean he's a curious man. He is a man with curiosity. He, uh, in the sense that you are not afraid to go out and, I mean, I know this from the work we've done together, to really take your music and allow it to develop into different directions, or to have collaborations which will bring different things out of you as a performer. Well, it's interesting, this collaboration with James, that does remind me in some ways of a collaboration with you and for, for those of you who may not be familiar, Paul and I have worked on a, uh, a show called Meet Me in the Middle of the Air, which took a, a set of songs of mine that were themed, very sort of broadly themed gospel, and then Paul arranged them. Um, but, uh, and I'd say, when I say arrange them, I mean rearrange them, totally <laughs> rewire them. So, but um, I do. I've, I, I, I've, I write. I have. I write pretty simple. I don't know many sort of um, fancy chords, so I do write pretty simply. And um, uh, it probably um, that's. What I think it helps working with you know, the, you know people like you and with James that that um, it is not. There's not a lot of clutter to start with, so we can sort of. Um, I guess my songs are pretty. And even when I play my own songs, um, you know, they can I can change them over the years. They they they're, they're sort of written on fairly 
what the guitar players call first position chords. They're just very basic chords, mm. so they can, um, they're fairly plastic, I guess. They can be moved around, mm. they can be sunk, they can, you can change the beat, you can, um, you can change the way they're Oh, playing. they're a dream to work with because of that strength. I mean, you know, the simplicity of those chords is also the strength of those chords. And it is, it's no coincidence that, you know, the great majority of folk musics in the world are things that people have ready access to. You know, it's the classical traditions which involve years and years and years of, you know, very intensive training mm. to be able to do certain very specific things. But the whole idea about music which we can all have a part of is that there is a point of access into that music. And I think that that's, uh, you know, it's, it's something, again, which takes it back to how we started. I mean, the, the relationship that Aboriginal people have to a music which enables them to tell stories, which, you know, the music doesn't possess within itself something which is intimidating or inaccessible. Mm. I think it's a really important thing. I read uh, a piece that you sent me recently written by Rachel Perkins, um, you know, another great Aboriginal voice, talking about you as a songwriter from an Aboriginal point of view and, and the way that, you know, the importance that your work has uh, in t for them, um, which I found very moving. How, how do you feel about that? I mean, about the stature that you have in that world? Uh, yeah, this, you, this songs, you, you write songs, you never know what they're going to do. Um, they, they just sort of, it's funny, so, songs become um, a song like From Little Things, Big Things Grow, it was just a song that never got, you know, it was just a, a song that I wrote with Kev. And mm. We liked it. We thought it told a really interesting story. And, um, and that was like sitting around a campfire, you wrote Sitting around a campfire, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was just put it out on a, a record. It was, was never a single, never did a film clip. Um, and it was, you know, it was seven minutes long, so, you know, it was never even thought of as being sort of commercial radio. It never got played in commercial radio. Mm. But sort of, it's just it's one of those songs that got more popular as time went on. And mm. so, you know, often when I play now, people call out for it. And the same, you know, when Kev plays. Mm. So you just, and, that, and that, you know, that song is now in most places I go, you know. So, but you never know. I don't know why that happens. That's, that's a mystery. <laughs> to be so modest and so great. No, it's not, it's not modest. It's just, you don't, you don't really know, you know, some, some, some songs you think are great, and you might, but then they're, they're not hits. What makes a song a hit? I, that, who can pick that? Well, I'll tell you what, it's, it's a strange thing. You really don't know how a piece of music is going to affect people. And it's, it's my own view that uh, a, any work of art, really, its trajectory isn't complete until it's received by somebody. Now, you might, as you say, you might write a song which you think is the best song ever written, but until somebody responds to it, until it's heard and given back to you, in that feedback loop. Oh yeah, I couldn't agree more. You, you know, you write a song and, it's, and not until you've actually played it to someone is, yeah. it, is it a song. It's, that's its yeah. birth. Well, I think we have to call that to an end and thank you both so much. It was fantastic and I really look forward to reading your article on the monthly this Friday. Uh, and Paul, thank you very much for coming. Pleasure. Thank you.